Okay, hello everyone. We're back uh, in to the book of Revelation. We're going to pick up where we left off before, which was chapter 1. We're going to pick up at chapter 1, uh, verse 4. Chapter 1, verse 4. Last week we got through three verses, and uh, uh, that's okay. We'll do the best we can. It's so good that uh, you're joining me this, this uh, afternoon. Uh, before we go any further, let's uh, bow our heads. Father in heaven, we do praise you. We thank you. We give you all the glory and all the honor that we possibly can, for thou art such an awesome, wonderful, tremendous God. Thou art the only God over heaven and earth. And we thank you for that, because in you there is much mercy and grace. And we pray that you would be merciful unto us who are mere be beings, uh, that you would show your mercy in such a way that uh, you would enable even us to understand what you have to say. Bless us with your Holy Spirit that he would guide us through all truth. In Jesus Christ's name, we ask it now and say thank you. Amen and amen. All right, uh, I'm sorry that we're not able to, uh, of course, answer questions as I'm doing this and stop and uh, take a breath or whatever. Of course, you can always pause me on there and then start me up again, but uh, uh, I wish we could uh, uh, communicate with each other directly. It's just not going to be possible, but if you do have some questions that uh, uh, you might have or, or any comments that you might have, uh, please uh, feel free to uh, let me know. And you can send me an email or you can send it by way of uh, Peg uh, Gifford and uh, I'll be sure to get it. And I will do my best to uh, address whatever comments you might have if it's needed. Sometimes you just have something to contribute, and that's wonderful. I just need to sit back and and uh, be blessed. All right, picking up where we left off, we're going to look at uh, Revelation chapter 1. Uh, the first part we did last week was the introduction, verses 1 through 3, and now we have the actual greeting, uh, verse uh, 4 through 5 what we'll call A. In other words, it's verse 4 and part of the first part of verse 5. Uh, it's a greeting of grace and it's a greeting of peace. Let's look at it now. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. All right, we'll back up here now. This uh, greeting is to the seven churches which are in Asia. It was the letter was originally uh, written to them. Uh, uh, the they were seven specific selected churches, or more churches than seven, by the way, back then. Uh, but they were of Asia. This was the Roman province of Asia, uh, uh, which today would be uh, modern-day uh, Turkey. Uh, now, again, I want to point out that these seven churches, which we'll get into, uh, as we read on later, uh, represent uh, in many respects uh, specific periods of the church age, and they reflect the overall general condition of the church of that particular period. And I'll point those out when we get to it about what years may be it. Although, even though it represents specific years, I want to say this. Uh, elements of all these churches can be found today. 
in one way or another, in one church or another. It doesn't mean any just one denomination or anything like that. Um, so it says, from him who is and who uh, was and, uh, and who is to come. John brought a greeting from God the Father here. Uh, greetings from God, who is described with this title. Uh, him who is and who was and who is to come speaks of the eternal nature of God. It has the idea of uh, timelessness, uh, eternal, a timeless being. And it's connected with very directly with the name Yahweh, which is found in the Old Testament, uh, especially in uh, Exodus 2.14 and many other places. Uh, the construction of who is, it says, who was and who is to come is kind of awkward in the ancient Greek. That's what the New Testament was written in was Greek. It seems that John searched for a phrase to communi communicate the Old Testament idea of Yahweh, God the Father. It is never enough just to say that God is. That isn't enough. I'm, I'm sorry. Or just to say that uh, God was. Or just to say that he is to come. As Lord... Think about this. As Lord over eternity, uh, he rules the past, he rules the present, and he rules the future. Uh, the description, it says, him who is and who was and who is to come applies to God the, the Son and God the Holy Spirit just as much as it does to God the Father. In fact, the title, uh, Yahweh, describes uh, the triune God. You know, he's one person, uh, but he is, or he's one God in three persons. Uh, the one God in three persons. Yet it seems that John focused on God the Father with this title because he specifically mentioned God the Son and God the Holy Spirit in the following words of this verse. So, it goes on and says, from the seven spirits who are before his throne. There have been many a people who have been tripped up by this, uh, confused even, and it was not meant to be that way. If, if you know your Bible, you read your Bible, the New Testament in particular, uh, you realize that God the Holy Spirit is uh, more than just one person in the sense that he has more than one characteristics. That's a good way to put it. Uh, uh, he's described with this title as having the seven spirits. The seven spirits, it says, who are before his throne, speaks of the perfection and completion of the Holy Spirit. John used an Old Testament description of the Holy Spirit. First book in the Bible, you find the Holy Spirit. In the last book of the Bible, you find the Holy Spirit. The idea of the seven spirits from the Old Testament, uh, Isaiah uh, chapter 11, verse 2, uh, describes seven aspects of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. It isn't that there are seven different spirits of God. Rather, the spirit of the Lord has these characteristics, as I said a moment ago, and he has them all in fullness and in perfection. You know, you may have different uh, uh, qualities, uh, of, in your character that are, that are admirable, but none of them to the fullness. You're not God, the Holy Ghost. All right. Uh, reading on. From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. 
And John brought a greeting from God, the Son, who is described by who he is and by what he has done. Uh, Jesus is the, what does it say? Faithful witness. This speaks of to Jesus' utter and total reliability and faithfulness to God the Father and also to his people, even unto death. The, and this is interesting. The, the ancient Greek word that's translated witness, uh, you know, if I asked everybody here, uh, uh, who here wants to be a witness, I dare say, you would all raise your hand. Uh, you'd want to be, wouldn't you? Well, the word that's translated witness, the Greek word, is also the exact same word for martyr. Martyr. Reading on, it says, the firstborn from the dead. This speaks to Jesus standing as preeminent among all beings, that he is the First in priority. Firstborn from the dead means much more than that Jesus was the first person resurrected. Uh, it also means that he is preeminent among all those who are or will be resurrected. Uh, Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. You know, there were there were numerous uh, resurrections, uh, people coming back to life in the Old and the New Testament, uh, and it, it, even before Jesus rose from the dead. The difference is they all died again except Jesus. He rose unto life, unto eternal life, because he is eternal. The use of the firstborn does not mean that Jesus had a birth date and is therefore a created being and that he is not God. The ancient rabbis called Yahweh himself, and I quote this, firstborn of the world. Uh, Rabbi uh, uh, Bakai cited uh, in uh, a fellow named Lightfoot great commentary that he wrote on Colossians. Uh, the rabbis also used firstborn as a messianic title. Firstborn, messianic title. Isn't that interesting? God said, as I made Jacob, a firstborn. That means messianic. Uh, Exodus 4.22, so also will I make King Messiah a firstborn. Psalm 89.28, uh, this was by a guy named Nathan uh, in Shema Rabba. Uh, I hope I pronounced that that right. Uh, is one uh, he, he, let me get back here. He cited Lightfoot in his commentary on Colossians. Jesus is the ruler over the kings over the kings. Before the book of Revelation is over, Jesus will take dominion over every single earthly king. The present time, Jesus rules a kingdom, but it is a kingdom that is not yet of this world. And you're going to say, to, well, Brother Gary, there's only one, a couple of kings maybe in the whole world. Oh, don't kid yourself. There are people in high places uh, politically that are uh, bowed down to as if they were king or queen. It's a shame, too. Um, but, you know, well, I'm not going to get off into that. <laughs> uh, in this greeting with its uh, systematic mention of each person of the Trinity, we see how the New Testament presents the doctrine of the Trinity. It doesn't present it in a carefully defined, systematic, theological way, uh, kind of way. It simply weaves the truth of the Trinity, that there is one God in three persons throughout the fabric of the New Testament. 
one God in three persons. We only believe in one God, but he is in three persons. That's hard to explain to people. Think of the egg, shell, uh, the white, and the, the yellow part. Uh, they're all, uh, you call it the yolk, I think. They're, they're, they're all diff separate. They di have different responsibilities. But uh, it's one egg, isn't it? All right, look at it that way. All right, verses, uh, the last half of verse 5 through verse 6, there's a statement of praise uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, here's what it says. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and made us has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. All right, let's look at that closer. That's a whole mouthful right there. To him who loved us. Uh, this is what a great, beautiful title of Jesus. Uh, when love, past tense, loved is used in the past tense. It points back to a particular time and place where Jesus loved us. It should be pointed out that many translations have loves us. Uh, New American Standard, the NIV, and the New Living uh, Testament. But uh, the King James has loved us. But there is something beautiful about loved us. It looks back. And this is why I like the King James. It looks back. It looks way back to the cross. He loved us way back to the cross. Every believer should be secure in God's love. Uh, not based on their present circumstances. Uh, uh, which might be very difficult at best. Uh, matter of fact, might be terrible. But based on the ultimate demonstration of love at the cross. This is worth praising Jesus about. This. I might say praise the Lord. Uh, amen. Uh, Paul put it like this in Romans 5, 8. Here's what he said. But God demonstrates his love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The work of Jesus on the cross for us is God's ultimate proof of his love for you. He may give additional proof, but he can give no greater proof than that. No wonder many believers are not secure in knowing the love of Jesus toward them. They look uh, to their present circumstances to measure his love. Instead, they need to look back to the cross. Settle the issue once and for all, friends. Give praise to Jesus, to him who loved us. He loved us all the way back. Goes on and says, and washed us, washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's what happened when Jesus loved us at the cross. He washed us. He cleansed us uh, from the deep stain, and it's a deep stain, my friend, of sin, so that we really are clean when we stand before him. You know, that's like I tell people, he washes you inside and out. Uh, this is worth praising Jesus about. You know, if we would just understand our own deep sinfulness, this seems almost too good to be true. Uh, I think we ignore our own sinfulness, so we might... Every once in a while, conjure up one or two things. But I'll tell you what, the older I get, the more I'm aware of uh, my sinfulness. 
Uh, we can stand clean before God, clean from the deepest stains. Uh, no wonder the same Apostle John, John wrote, if we confess our sins, what? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John uh, 1, 9. That's a good verse to lay up the memory. Continuing, it says, in his own blood. If there were any other way to wash us from our sins, listen here, God would have done it that other way. If there was any other way, he'd have done it. To wash us in his own blood meant the ultimate sacrifice of God the Son. God wouldn't do it this way unless it was the only way, friends. I mean, use some sense here. The priests could only cleanse with blood of bulls and goats and whatever. But he has washed us from our sins in his own blood. What do we say? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Uh, men are willing enough to shed the blood of others, how willing are they uh, to enter upon war, it seems like, at the slightest provocation. But Christ was willing to shed his own blood to pour out his own soul unto death that we might be saved. That's what Spurgeon told us. Notice the order. First, loved. Then washed. It wasn't that God washed us out of some sense of duty and then loved us because we were uh, then clean. He loved us while we were dirty. But then he washed us. You know? In fact, washing proves love. If you have an old pair of pants and got them covered in paint, uh, I'm, I'm quoting this here now. In paint, uh, you would only wash them and keep them for two reasons. First, you might wash them and keep them if you were poor. You can't or won't spend money. There's a, yeah, that won't. On another pair of pants, so you wash them and keep them. Second, second reason. You might wash them and keep them if you really love those old pair of pants. Huh? You know, some, some people have old socks that they, they just won't give up. Uh, or old pair of shoes or boots that they just, you know, got to have those galoshes, you know, whatever. Or, or maybe it's an old skirt. Uh, do they still have skirts? Or blouse or shirt or whatever. You keep them because you really love those old apparel, whatever it was, pants. Money isn't the issue. You could go down and buy a new pair of pants anytime you want it, but you love that pair so much that you spend the time and the effort to clean them and use them again. I, you know, I've got some favorite clothes. The only time I get rid of favorite clothes is when I can't wear them anymore. I'd like to say they get too big for me, but they really get too small. Uh, God loves us so much that he washed us, it says. God certainly is not poor. Uh, with merely a thought, he could obliterate, obliterate, obliterate every sinner and start over with a brand new bunch. But he doesn't. He loves us so much that he washed us, the Bible says here. Some scholar, they believe that John wrote and loosed, I'm quoting here, loosed us from our sins. There's only one letter difference between the words washed and loosed in the Greek language. Both words show up in ancient uh, manuscripts. So it's hard to say which one John wrote. Nevertheless, both are true, isn't it? 
we are both washed and loosed from our sins. Amen. And he has made us kings and priests to God. That's what the scripture, reading on with the scripture. He made us kings and priests to his God and Father. This is a status Jesus gives to those whom he loved. All the way back at the cross. In his work on the cross and who are washed with in his own blood. That's what the text says. It would have been enough just to love them and cleanse them, but he goes far beyond and makes us, watch this. It says he makes us kings and priests to his God and Father. This is more than Adam ever achieved or was, even in the innocence of uh, the Garden of Eden. We never read that Adam among, was among the kings and uh, priests of God. This is worth praising God about. Uh, no question uh, about it. We are kings, so we are God's, think about this, we are God's royalty. God's royalty. Now, that's a privilege. That's a privilege. It's a status, and it has authority. Uh, we are priests. So we are God's special servants. You never thought of it that way, did you? You thought you were a servant, maybe, at one time or another. But you are his special servant. We represent God to man and man to God. Think about that. We offer sacrifice unto him. The, the book of Hebrews 13, 15 says... We have privileged access to God's presence, Romans 5, 1 and 2. You know, we, we talk about Jesus on the cross and his arms going straight out each way. And, he's, you know, he, he's, he's extending his arm around the world. Listen, as a child of God, you're like this. you got one arm towards heaven and one arm to those around you. You are God's holy priest ministering to your fellow man. At least we should be, amen. Kings and priests, it says. In the Old Testament, it was forbidden to, to combine the offices of king and priest. King uh, uh, Uzziah of Judah is an example of a man who tried to combine the two offices and it, the Bible tells us he paid the penalty. Uh, 2 Chronicles 26, 16 through 23. Under the new covenant, we can be like Jesus in the sense that he is both king and high priest. Uh, Luke 1, 31 through 33 and Hebrews uh, 4, 14. I never thought of myself as being a king. <laughs> But, you know, compared to the rest of the world, I'm a king. Or, or compared to the worldly, because of Jesus. And I am a king, and so are you. If you're a child of God, i tell you how. You have royal blood flowing through your veins. Amen. It's royal blood. It's the blood of Jesus. All right. Reading on, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. In light of all that Jesus did for us, it is right to praise him. We should honor him with all glory and dominion forever and ever. When we say this, we aren't giving Jesus glory and dominion. We are simply recognizing that he has it, and honoring him for it. He has it, with or without us. To recognize the glory of Jesus is to come out and out for him. All the way. Uh, some, 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 some of us, uh, I'm going to quote here now. 
I'm going to blame this on Spurgeon too. Some of us are like a mouse behind the wainscot. Uh, you are in the Lord's house. You are not known as one of the families. Sometimes you, uh, you give a little squeak in your hiding place, and sometimes you come out at night, as the mouse does, to pick up a crumb or two without being seen. Is this worthy of yourself? Is it worthy of your Lord and Master? Questions asked by Spurgeon. I guess we all should listen to it and answer it. To recognize the dominion, that's the word here, of Jesus is to let him truly rule over us. Again, if we truly say to him, be glory and dominion, then we must give him dominion over ourselves. Each uh, of us is a little empire of three kingdoms. Body, spirit, and so, and it should be a united kingdom. Uh, make Christ's kingdom all of it. Do not allow any branch of those three kingdoms to set up for itself a distinct rule. Put them all under the sway of one king. Again, I quoted Spurgeon. I've been quoting Spurgeon a lot, it seems like, today, but... I guess he, he hit, it, hit the spot for this. And then there is the word, amen. This is a familiar word to every one of us. This word in the ancient Greek language brought over to the, from the Hebrew to the, of the Old Testament simply means yes. Yes. It isn't a wish that it may be so, but it is an affirmation that through God it will be so. Jesus will be praised in and through us. Jesus has done all this and much more for you and me and all born-again believers. Uh, we have much to praise him for, so praise him. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hope you do. Would you not wish to be in heaven when your life is over? I'm now I'm quoting again. Here it goes. Would you not wish to be in life in heaven when your life on earth is over? The time will come when you must die. Would you not desire to have a good hope of entering then into the felicities? You know that's not for me. <laughs> that's for Persian on. That word. Felicities, I've got to use that sometimes, of the perfected ones. I am sure you would. But if you are at last to be numbered amongst the redeemed host on high, you must here learn their song. You need to learn the music here. You cannot be admitted into the choirs of heaven above without having practiced and rehearsed their music here below now there's an application there not just it's not really talking about music it's talking about life okay and that was by Spurgeon the Greek word uh, amen is a transliteration of a Hebrew word of sim similar sound meaning truth or faithfulness hence the meaning be it true or so be it Feller by the name of Walbert uh, uh, said that, and uh, I'm a great admirer of him. And uh, he wrote a commentary. He and a fellow named Zuck, uh, the best commentary I think. But uh, anyway, Walbert said that. All right, we're going to stop there. I think uh, we run about 35 minutes. We're going to pick up uh, verse 7 because there's a transition here. Uh, the opening description of the return of Jesus. And that's what, what we're going to be looking at.
next week. Let me straighten this thing out. Right, we'll do that right at the very end. Doesn't that help? <laughs> I hope that uh, you've gotten something out of this lesson. If so, let me know. If not, let me know. No, don't tell me if you hadn't. <laughs> but if you have something to contribute, uh, you let me know. Amen. I appreciate everyone that signed up for this. I think there's about 82 or something like that. Uh, we'll be back again next week with a, with another. Uh, we'll pick up it. We got six verses now in two weeks. I think that's pretty good. You say, well, that's not very much. Well, listen, this is the word of God. This is God talking. You know, we are just mortal men and women. That, you know, you think you can grasp the things of God with just the the flip of a penny? No way, shape, or form. It takes it takes some time, doesn't it? So stay with me. We, believe me, we'll get through this. Uh, we may be old, but uh, older than we are now, but we'll get through it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we do praise you. We thank you. We give you honor. Oh, all the honor, because you are God, you are eternal, you are the creator of all, you are the blessed Savior, you are the one who keeps us, you are the one who delivers us. We, we thank you, dear Lord, for cleansing us of, with your precious blood. Now, as we close this Bible study, help us to read our Bibles more often, help us to be more familiar with your with your text. Help us to study on our own. Help us, dear Lord, to, to share the things. Tell other people that there's a, there's a Bible study going on somewhere, somehow, someplace, and right here is one of them. And if they have no place else to go, they're welcome to come. Uh, uh, let us know, Lord, uh, Lord, uh, what we can do to reach out to others with your word. Now keep us all safe. Uh, keep uh, all your people safe and from harm. Keep all those who are, who are hurting in a special way. Give them mercy. And then bring us back, back again next week. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. God bless you all.